Right. Well, hey, everybody. Right. Welcome to Over 50 Starting Over. I am Barry Edwards. And I'm Merle Garrison. Yeah. So here we are coming at you. On, we will be launching this Monday, Monday morning, tomorrow. And uh, shifting up our schedule a little bit, trying to get it out a little earlier in the week. Next week, we're going to shoot on Tuesday. So we'll come out on Wednesday. We're trying to find our new, our footing. As Merle is super busy in the world, uh, deep business world, sales yeah. and training. And, you know, I wanted to ask you a lot about this. Uh, oh. Uh, there's, you know, what probably what I get commissioned to do mostly these days for quite some time mm -hmm. is fixing people's online presence. So, so I'm going to go out and have a website done their social media, whatever, and it doesn't work. It just, it doesn't convert into clients. So I have to do a bunch of tricks like uh, polish up the SEO search engine optimization, uh, get a content marketing plan going, uh, promote them on LinkedIn and Facebook to drive people to the website. And then the website has to communicate correctly and clearly uh, in order to get them to fill out the form and convert them from prospect into customer. So you, on the other hand, are, I, I don't know, how much is it the old fashioned way? As a salesperson, you have to start up a sales funnel, I believe from scratch, right? They're not handing you anything. Correct. There are a couple of things that were lingering out there that um, are cool. going to be things that I'm going to be working on. In fact, I'm already working on um, something that was left over, but yeah, that's not, not anything I can depend on as, uh, hey, look at all this that I have. For the most part, I have to create my own, my own uh, uh, prosperity here. And I, I want to clear up something from the last show because you were asking me if I was the account manager. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I didn't answer that properly because really I'm in the role that I'm in. I'm the hunter uh, it's all new business for me. Mm. So I'm not managing accounts. Uh, I assume that after I sell an account at some point, it'll transition to the account manager. They don't call it that in our, in our sure. business, but yeah, it'll transition. So my, my job is really more of a hunter. So you're right. Most of my job, especially in the beginning is going to be a lot of prospecting. Mm. Just shut off that one light. I look shiny today. You did a little bit. You look yeah. a lot better now. Yeah, there we go. I, I actually shut off my uh, little ring light there. But with this yeah, oh, new is camera, that what it was? Yeah. yeah. This new camera, everything's brighter. I was um, wondering if it was real hot over there. Oh, well, it is. is oh, it, my God. Yeah. You guys I, have been in a big heat wave lately. Yeah, all of July, um, for sure. And, and it's for the foreseeable future as well. It's pretty typical your neck of the woods, right? It is. It's always extreme weather. You know, right, we get like right. three days that are actually 72 degrees and sunny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But so, yeah, we are in some deep humidity, uh, be 94 and humid today. And I, just, I hope it rains. I hope we get thunderstorms. Right I love there. thunderstorms. Like you, as you know, we don't really get those out. I don't here. understand that. So you it might have something to do with the humidity. I'm not really sure. We oh. don't really have a humidity factor out here. That's true. That, that might be it. But, be um, it. yeah, I, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not uh, real good at this, but I understand thunderstorms happen when like cold fronts and warm fronts kind of rub up against each other. And uh, somehow, we yeah, don't really I, have that Rocky Mountain cold front, warm front effect. Uh -huh. I think that's why, but mm. I'm not really sure. It, it makes with sense. Tornadoes. We don't have tornadoes out here either. We just right. have earthquakes. And fires. And Massive fires. fires. So speaking yeah. of that, we had a, there was one right down the road from our house the other day. It was wow. kind of, it was like, are you kidding? It was just huge plumes. It's that season oh. now, isn't it? Oh, it's so dry out here. I mean, yeah. I think if somebody flicks a cigarette out their window the way people do, I don't mm -hmm. think they do that out here. I don't smoke, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, damn, every, everything could just go up. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's kindling wood out here. Wow. Well, hey, back to, uh, yeah. so you're not managing accounts at all, correct? No, no. I'm going, okay. my, my, there is another, um, on my sales team, there are people that handle accounts, which are most of the people that are in sales on mm. the team that I'm on. And then I specialize in going after new accounts. Gotcha. New so what I'm wondering is, you know, 
I, I rely on repeat business and word of mouth primarily. And hey, the podcast as well. It's marketing for me. It keeps me out there. Uh, I don't cold call. And um, back in the day, though, when I started my business, I did. And I started out with the whole, I better make 50 cold calls to get three responses to make one sale. Those were the stats back then. And it's certainly harder now. Everybody's got a voicemail. If you even get past a uh, receptionist or something like that, you're going to voicemail all the right, time. Right, right. So I don't know what the stats are today. How, what are the tricks? How are you going to build your new pipeline? Uh, good question. So um, referral business is always the best, even though I'm handling, um, you know, accounts that are brand new logos. Uh, I have a network, uh, you know, LinkedIn is a great tool for yes. that. And I have a network of people that I've worked with in the past, whether they're uh, working for hospitals or working with hospitals. A uh, referral business is always the best way to go at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, there's always the uh, the old fashioned pound the phones and and get people on the line and talk to them. I, I you can't get away from that. I mean, mm -hmm. this is uh, this is how the business is gonna gonna grow, and the only way you're gonna grow the business is by talking to people. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned along the way is that that admin assistant is going to be your best friend. Mm. And while a lot of people would discount that person as, oh, well, they're, you know, not that important. They know the schedule of the person you're mm. trying to get a hold of. They know the personality. They are the gatekeeper. Mm. They're getting pounded every day by people that don't care about them. Um, if you can uh, establish a, a dialogue with those people, and I mean, just be yourself, you know, that's the whole thing. Just be yourself. Yeah. I, you know, the way I always look at it is you're, you're making new friends. Don't be fake, but you're making new friends. And not only do they know about that person, like let's say, for instance, it's a chief medical officer or chief uh, uh, medical information officer, they know who gets things done within that organization as well. And they usually have a relationship with those people. Um, they, they can be great coaches for you going as you're swimming oh. through that, that whole network. And, um, you know, um, a lot of times you're not going to get that, um, chief, XX mm -hmm. on the line, mm -hmm. but what you can ask them is if they have a, a wingman, you know, somebody that um, does this type of research for them because they typically do. And can you introduce me to that person? And that's, that's really smart. that person's job. Yeah. So um, this is really what my strategy is going to be. And also you have to figure right now we're in COVID-19 time. So yeah. Uh, you're, that whole hard sell approach is probably not going to work at this time. So, right. um, you know, even if you do get to talk to somebody, it might just be your win might just be getting some type of information in their hands uh, that may not even apply to your product right now, it may apply to the situation that they're in so that you can just establish a dialogue and a, a trust going forward. So mm. um, those are the things. Now, we have some great databases that we use on our end. We also have, uh, and this is bonus, uh, we have a, a, a force of people that actually do cold calling for us. Uh, so I can work in tandem with those people. And I already have a couple of opportunities that have bubbled up over the last week. So really exciting stuff. Nice. Yeah, yeah. It is. So you're doing a lot of training uh, right, right now. now right? Yeah. You know, it's the proverbial, you know, trying to sip from a fire hose. The good news for me is that I've been in this industry for yeah. quite some time. Uh, I know a lot about the industry, but I can't pretend to know everything about the nuances of, of this company and, and, you know, what their product is and the pricing and all the different systems that we use. And there's a lot of different um, platforms that you use on the internal side of the business. Uh, 
you know, you had something for HR, you got something for mm. this, something for that. Mm. And some of it's a lot of it's new for me. So there's a lot of, uh, it, there's it, it, every day has been, uh, from morning until night, nonstop, pretty much video, uh, mm. conferencing and mm. going over PowerPoint presentations and stuff like that. You know, what I think is really interesting is what you said. Uh, you observe that right now, you surmise anyway, that during this COVID period, you're best off taking a, a, an approach of earning trust and just trying to help people rather than try to make a hard sale. I have to say, too, I've been extremely busy uh, for the last easily more than a month. And it's because I've mentioned before, because a lot of my clients are like, oh my God, I'm finally taking your advice. We need to put this online, we need to automate more and, and that kind of thing. And um, I'm really, really, and I'm always hearing too, but you know, I'm not bringing in a lot of money right now. Uh, hear that from everyone. And I'm really taking the approach of, I just feel like I'm really helping these people. And I structure my day like half a day for this client, half a day for that client, doing a lot of Zoom calls with them. And dude, I'm not billing uh, my, all my time just because I'm just really literally trying to help build a new foundation for these people and really feel like I'm helping out and making a difference during this time when we all, we, man, we need to help each other. We just, it's Boy, a tough time. I, you know what? I've been reading this book, Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. And um, one of the things, one of the pillars that, uh, he has brought out, and I really believe this, and this is what you're doing, um, is giving. Giving mm -hmm. of either, you know, to charity or giving of your time or teaching uh, without expecting any kind of return is sort of like gravity. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a law. Um, you, when you give, it always comes back to multiplied. And so what, the thing that you're doing right now, um, you know, you said some of it, you're, you're just not billing for, you're trying to help right. out. And that's right. your motivation is to help. It feels um, good. The, this is the secret to wealth. Yeah, I, I agree. I, lo I love that good. you're doing that. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and see, and that's the other thing too, Barry, is that when you, when you have that heart, like for instance, for me, with the business that I'm in, if I, if I have just my heart is, okay, I got to make this money today. Yeah. You know, it's it become sort of a grind. It's a grind. But it's the right if, word. If you're really doing it because you know, you can help and really the mm -hmm. platform that we have can actually save lives, maybe even my own life or, mm -hmm. or more importantly, the life of my loved ones. Yeah. Um, then it becomes like this mission, like you yeah. get to do this. Yeah. And there's it really this does. motivation. Like you spring out of bed in the morning, yeah. like, yeah, who do I get to talk to today? You know, what's strange about this is that I've, I think we've all always heard this throughout our careers, this kind of advice, what we're talking about is uh, helping people and uh, rather than just chasing the dollar. However, for some, it's different now when, when you actually put it in the action, there's a shift that does happen that you feel uh, that's, that's how I've felt lately. And it's nice. Oh, yeah. I like it. I for like sure. It. For sure. And it's something that, you know, probably the best thing to do is start out your day thinking that way so mm. that uh, you don't actually get tricked into thinking it's all about the money. Of course, we need the money, right? Of course. I mean, we, we all have to eat. I know mm. I like to eat. Um, and but, you know, if we if we t put, take our focus off of us and put it on to other people, mm -hmm. there's a, not only is wealth created that way, but happiness is created that way. Yeah. And we only go around this one time in life. We might as well be happy. We might as well be having fun too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about teams last week. This plays right into that as well, hand in hand. And it's like, uh, <clears throat> I use the example of I'm on these Zoom meetings all the time with my clients now, way more than I ever had contact before. And I'm loving it. That's why I feel that I am helping them and cooperating and working with them uh, it's really a, a huge improvement. And I, th hopefully we can all carry this with us as we move forward. We are using zoom more now when you're communicating. I think we said this last week, when you're just communicating via email or even voicemails and stuff like phone calls, 
but especially via email, all tone is lost. No facial yeah. expressions to read. No smiles. That's important. You I see think so too. Smile. You, yeah. you know, it's interesting in this uh, new company that I'm with, the culture is really, and it may have a lot to do with the fact that it's COVID-19. I don't know if this sure. was the culture before, but pretty much everything has been video conference calls for me. And, um, and I'm it's already cool. getting, um, working with my team and uh, different uh, regarding different accounts that we're, that we're going after. And, uh, Boy, I just love just getting together and mm. talking about strategy and, and just kicking things around. And I, I, I agree with you. Just being able to see those people, mm -hmm. boy, this technology is really something. I mean, we didn't have to drive several, several hours to get together. We're just, boom, right there and together. And then drive several miles back. Yeah. It's and such a waste tired. of time. Yeah. yeah. Time yeah. and money. Right. Yeah, for sure. So no, that's and you know, the other thing this can't be understated is you got to like what you're doing. Or yeah, at least what you're selling and the people yeah. around you, at least most of the people around you. This is all yeah. very important. If you don't, you, you either need to make a mind shift or a job shift. A yeah, shift. that's true. <clears throat> like, have you ever worked with anyone that you didn't like? No, no. Well, I've always, uh, since I was 27, <laughs> I've worked on my own. So right. yeah, I can say that I pretty much liked everybody yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me yeah. too. I'm not going to name names, but I have actually worked with um, <clears throat> at least one person that I don't think they liked me. Um, oh, but I, how I, could that be possible? You know, there's there's mental You're the illness world's out most there. Most likable guy, <laughs> but you know that you know oh. the type. Everyone knows the type of person that tries to drag other people down. That's how right, they bring themselves right. up. That's not a <clears throat> right. likable person. No, and that's actually the you, you pegged it. That's the personality I was working with, and mm. just made life miserable for not only me but mm -hmm. everybody else around. And mm -hmm. and it became a grind. It was just yeah. like every day was just like ah. Oh. Yeah. This is terrible. And it's I like, had to leave. It's like when you're trying to cooperate on, a, on a, the same goal, which we all do. We work in teams, back to teams again. And you got right. that one person that's trying to point out what everybody else is doing wrong. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. much how they see their position in life. Well, oh, especially it's if it's the leader of the team. That's Ooh. just, you know, how oh, that stuff rolls downhill. Yeah. Um, you know, the leader is in charge of the culture. And yeah, for if, sure. they, if they're poisoning the culture, boy, it just makes everything uphill. You know, I noticed this uh, since I was in my 20s. And even back then, I was working with some Fortune 500 companies and all the way down to very, very small businesses, everything in between. And I noticed early on, is that the entire company, no matter how big or small, took on the personality of that person at the top. Yeah, and, it really does. Yeah, so if it's a really good person, it's very cooperative, works from a place of more or less love, oh boy, you got a great culture. But if you got one of those people that operates from a place of fear, like your job is always in je yes. jeopardy, that's right. a horrible culture. How do you get up in the morning and go to that every day? I, you know what? I, you got me thinking about an organization I was working with mm -hmm. where the guy at the top was a real egocentric guy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, he had the Napoleon syndrome thing oh. going on. And just every time I had to interface with his, his team that he had underneath of him, uh, when he was there, it was this dark experience. But anytime I interfaced with them when he wasn't around, it was just all sunshine and happiness. But uh, boy, I'm surprised I mean, it didn't have the lingering effect. It, it, it actually, you know, it's interesting how that worked. It was like as soon as he showed up, everything changed. Like we could be in a conference room having a great time. And then when he showed up, yeah. boom. I Oof. mean, it was everybody clammed up. Oh, um, the dark they, cloud came over. They were the afraid. Room. They, they oh. were intimidated by him. And um, <clears throat> he, it, I felt sorry for those guys. And a lot of them ended up leaving very quickly. Uh, yeah. And really great. He had some really great talent around him, but he, oh. he, uh, he burned the talent. Oh, I think that's a good way to put it. You know, Lisa had a few years ago had a, a position 
that was the worst case of everything we're talking about with the worst leader you can imagine. And she is such a, like a plus cross all your T's dot your I's kind of person right. that it felt like failure to her on a daily basis. It was so oppressive and she would come home in tears every night mm. and it affected her health so badly. Yes. And, and she, but I mean, to her credit, she's got the best 050 story ever. We talk about all the time. One of these days we got to have her on to, to tell this story, but she's kind of camera shy. If you haven't noticed, uh, but she, to her credit, uh, she had to leave the job uh, very abruptly. Her health was in great jeopardy and then uh, took months of beating the pavement and strategizing to orchestrate where her career is now in the healthcare industry and strategy. She's making a big difference in the oh, I entire love healthcare industry. She uh, helped launch a product called Lumina, which is... Uh, what do you call those scans? Like CAT scans and the other yeah. one, uh, MRIs, yes. uh, I think. And it's revolution. They're trying to revolutionize the healthcare industry by standardizing the cost. It's like $300 rather than 3000 or 5000 or whatever, really? or whatever they're going to charge your interest of your insurance company behind your back. Cause you don't know, you don't even think about right. it. No. And, so they're helping, hoping to change, uh, start to make uh, some waves in the entire healthcare industry doing this. Wow, and she cool. led this entire project from designing the logo <clears throat> for the team. And I came in and did uh, shot some uh, photos and videos for them. Had to do a pro bono because it otherwise would have been a conflict of interest. Right, a relationship. Right. Yep. But anyways, uh, Pretty cool. I, ju I just want to put that little inspirational story out there that how it, you owe it to yourself to, to take control of your career and put it where you want it to be, where you're making a difference and, and you're enjoying, you enjoy the challenge of it and the reward of it. You know, that you're saying a mouthful right there. And I'm, I'm so glad Lisa got out of there because look, if she hadn't have gotten out of there, she wouldn't have been able to experience this wonderful thing where she can use all of her talents and her yeah. skills. And yeah. I mean, this is what she was made for. But, you know, sometimes people get caught into this trap of guilt. Like I, I, I shouldn't quit my job or I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I need to just toughen up here and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But um, you're right. I mean, these things affect your health, Yeah. Uh, not only your physical health, but your mental health as well. And you can't be the person that you need to be at work. Mm -hmm. You certainly can't be the person you need to be at home, which is more important. More I, I have a motto that says that I, I, I don't live to work. I work to live. Yeah. It's, it's the living part. It's the stuff that happens after hours. That's really the most important thing. It's with your, your, your loved ones. That's, that's why you're working in the yeah. first place. And, um, you know, of course I have the story with my dad and he had that high pressure job. And when he, mm -hmm. he, he announced his retirement and he was going to be leaving the company he, he'd been working for, for 30 years. Um, and uh, within six weeks, he had a heart attack and he died. He never got to experience the retirement. And uh, same with my father. Same with yeah. Lisa's father. I, I, Anne Marie and I both have had these experiences before, where we had to leave. And you know, I remember leaving a, a job that I just really, boy, it just wasn't for me. And it led to this fantastic experience that I had with Extension Healthcare, which really led me to where I am right now. Nice. Um, and, uh, Anne Marie had a similar experience too. And it just, you know, these are soul crushing experiences and That's when they're right. happening, it's not worth it. It, it's no matter not. how much they're paying you, it is not worth, you might as well get a job, uh, selling bait and tackle down at the beach and being yeah. happy yeah. Uh, for minimum wage yeah. than getting paid, you know, uh, huge bucks uh, to be miserable, to, to be miserable and possibly die. I mean, because there those you are go. Mistakes. That's what we just, yeah, we just uh, gave uh, real examples of that. And to your point, uh, what can happen, the trap, is that you slowly get beaten up. You get beaten yeah. down. You can even, I have... I have battled depression uh, throughout my adult life. Uh, and I have come to the conclusion that you don't know that you're in it until you're yeah. on your way out of it and you're looking back. <laughs> and so yes. it's tough. I mean, you gotta, you gotta take a hard look 
and, and, uh, and, and decide where you're at and what you need to do if you need to make a move to go I forward. agree. Sometimes agree. we need to make our own shift. That uh, uh, Wayne Dyer always had an expression that I love. It's not, it sounds like a play on words, it, but it's not. It's so important. And that is change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. Boy, that's, that's just pure and simple. What my dad told me is that you need you know to change your attitude. Say. At the time that you go, you're a little kid and you go, I can't help the way I feel. He goes, yes, you can. Yeah, he, he <laughs> actually used his big finger and pointed into my chest like that when he said that. Boy, did I ever hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel it right now, but boy. It, you made, he was so you right. told me about that in college and it left an impression on me, even though yeah. it was just a story of what yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's, he was so, I remember I didn't believe him when he said that. Yeah. I, I pretended that I believed him and I went upstairs and beat up a pillow, you know, pretending it was him. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember him going, hey, what's going on? up there <laughs> Not, nothing I, I fell down you know there's so many good uh lessons here about again i want to just expound on the change the way you look at things and things uh you look at change what that is you you bring an energy to a room you can you can bring it up or you can bring it down we yeah. all do and yeah. in a relationship so this that's your workplace but even in your relationship if you have a shift, if you have an aha moment that just makes you realize something new and you're seeing things with a brand new, more clear, more positive perspective, your relationship will change. The, you will think that your partner changed, but it's not. It's a dynamic you brought to your relationship that changed. Boy, you, you got that right. Yeah, it's something I've, I've been thinking a lot about too recently is this whole COVID-19 thing that we're all going through. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to get, it's, it's tempting to, to be just angry or even depressed over this whole yeah, thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, the news I, is depressing. Oh, it is. It really is. And I, I, you know, I'm susceptible to that as well as everybody else, but I really believe this, that if we can just get past the emotional side of this whole thing, and open up our mind, our creative minds, because when we're emotional, we're not creative. Mm. That, it, emotions block creativity. Mm. Um, and when we can, if we can get past that, there are all kinds of opportunities here. Not just, not just. Uh, there's personal opportunities for growth. We've talked about this before, Barry. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just uh, while you're at home, you have more time. You can be reading. You could be sharpening your saw in many different ways. But there are business opportunities out there to be had. I was just the other day, I was getting all angry about how they're trying to keep the, the school systems closed out here. And what, what's going to happen with these kids and, these, and the parents? How are they going to go to work when they have to take care of their kids? And I started thinking about colleges that are shut down. And then I started thinking, hey, wait a second. The seeds of opportunity are just lying right there yes, in front are. of us on this whole thing. You've got college professors that are sitting around twiddling their thumbs. Meanwhile, you've got kids that are sitting at home and you've got the Zoom platform here at the same time. Um, there's, I mean, there's a, there's a way to exponentially lift the education of students right now above and beyond what they would get if they were coming into class right now. And for somebody that's entrepreneurial, putting that together, maybe I shouldn't say anymore. <laughs> you can get away your own idea. Yeah, exactly. But I agree with you completely. And any kind of change, there's a ton of opportunity. And there certainly is not. It does make me think about the guest uh, episode I just did a couple of days ago, which is out now. So look that up with uh, Neil Singh. He talks, he's really passionate about uh, helping tech entrepreneurs out in Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. And he's got a really great positive perspective on things too. It's a quick half hour episode. So you guys should check it out. And while I'm thinking about it, please go to over50startingover.com and subscribe to our podcast or check out our video. Please. But so subscribe to our email list so you get this right into your email box uh, the morning it drops. All right. So please do that. Right on. Oh, there's so many things, Merle, that uh, you made me think about. We were talking 
a lot about here. Basically, the I would say it comes down to the responsibility that we have for our own feelings. Uh, and, you know, and this is, uh, this is the problem that we are in right now, socially, culturally right now. So now I see today there's a petition out there asking Trader Joe's to remove racist packaging of ethnic food products from brands such as Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben's and Eskimo Pie. Of course, we have the Washington Redskins debacle and now Cleveland's talking about it with the Indians. Folks. Jesus, do we all need to rewatch Sesame Street? Have Big Bird teach us how uh, sticks and stones can break our bones, but words can't hurt us? I mean, really? Because this is where we're at. Everybody is getting on a, a soapbox on how their feelings are hurt and are just killing culture. Now, I don't know. Is Aunt Jemima racist? I really don't know. Aunt Jemima is not racist. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt you. No, but dude. It makes me angry no. to think that Aunt Jemima is somehow racist. Do you know that Aunt Jemima is a real person? Uh, I didn't know that, that. that. That's actually her. And, oh. uh, and that she actually was one of, if not the first black millionaire in the, in the country. Really? It's yes. a total celebration of her, though. Her family is completely against this whole thing, but of course, it's now uh, oh. corporate owned. It's not her company sure. anymore. Sure. She's long gone now. But this, like you said, this should be a celebration mm -hmm. of, 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 of pride here in mm -hmm. America uh, that this person made it this way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, that's, that's actually her. She, it's not a. a Anyway, no, this, but this is what's so crazy. It comes back to the fact that we are pandering to the, all these snowflakes that are finding, absolutely scouring uh, the internet or whatever, trying to find things to be offended about so, so that they could be heard. Yeah, I got a story for you. This, this really paints a picture. So about a year ago, uh, I got conned into doing an Airbnb with this young, young kid. I typically and very careful. I was pretty new at it at the time though. So I did, this kid has a party. So he's, he's probably about 19, 20 years old. Uh, we were texting back and forth. He's like, please, I really need, I just need to, uh, because my brother's coming into town and my dad doesn't have enough space. So it's just one night. That's all. I won't have anybody over going to be, uh, and I don't have any reviews. So I need to get a good review under my belt. All of this. Okay. He throws a party. That's what it was. So that's a kid's apparently do these days is find an Airbnb place to have a party because they can't go, they're not old enough to go to bars yet. You know, by all accounts, it sounded like uh, my neighbor said they're sounding. Oh, so the night before I'm doing my typical clean cleaning of the place before new guests arrive, I wash and dry my iPhone. Turns oh. out iPhones don't take well to that. No. So it was destroyed. First time in my adult life, I'm without a phone. He throws a party at my house that night. I'm, and I'm thinking, I'll uh, get a, a new phone on Amazon in a few days. It'll be nice to not have a phone for a few days. That's what I'm thinking. the most, right? And oh my God. So I wake up to an email of pictures of a uh, couple of cops at my house with sirens <laughs> on. <laughs> oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> so they ended up uh, waking up this party at 1.30 in the morning. Uh, no damage or anything, but no, it, I, I learned so. But here was the point. So you learn a lot about your Airbnb guests when you clean up after them. Uh, it's uh -oh. in whatever you see in the garbage or how things are arranged. Uh, you, you see element. You can piece together. It's like a. It's like doing a Columbo thing. You're piecing together yeah. the mystery. You know. You're getting clues. All right. So. I have a lot of different artworks. When I go on a trip, I like to get some kind of like a sculpture or something like that from where I went. So I, and I've always loved Greek, uh, especially Greek mythology. I had this little mini bust of David on my mantle, the fireplace mantle. Then on the other side of the room though, completely uh, juxtaposed is these wooden sculptures I got from Jamaica that look, they look kind of like African art or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. I've seen this kind of art, yeah. Sure, I, and I love this stuff. I found both of these things in a box upstairs in a spare room. Dude, 
you could see it. I could see it unfold. So these kids are walking in and now they are looking for something to be offended about and called yes. racist. They yes. saw these things as being racist. And you know what they're doing is they're giving positive reinforcement to who's the biggest wuss. Whose feelings are hurt? <laughs> this is the I this know. is the time we live in, though. It uh, is the time we I live couldn't in. believe that ten years ago, five years ago, I could never have dreamt that up that this could have happened. Like if somebody told me that, well, somebody's going to see that statue of David as a symbolization of white men, and then you got this jungle art over here. That's really racist. I uh, it never yeah. would have occurred to me, and nobody could have made me believe it. But that's what's going and, on. And I still don't believe it. I, yeah, that's disgusting. And, um, and also just so presumptive to take oh, yeah. your art yeah. and box it up. And, and I almost it, felt it violated, too. Yeah. That well, was it, like, it, what it the hell are you doing in my house? Yeah, yeah, it's my decor. Yeah, that is yours. Exactly. Yeah. And, and not only that, he was taking advantage of the situation by having a party yeah. there to begin with. Uh, what a punk. Well, they, they really, my neighbors all said they seem like good kids. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it, I, my point to all of this is that we are rewarding this wussification. We really society. are. We really and that's got to stop. Yeah. Our, our ent- free speech is done. It's been done for a long time now. We talk about what's going on in social media all the time but it's you know when we got this crap going on with uh uncle ben's rice aunt jemima and i did not i'm glad that you said you told me about aunt jemima was a very real person and right. this really truly should be celebrated this is ridiculous i said too about the washington redskins first of all they got a very cool logo and i like their colors everything it's a me celebration too of the culture it's not derogatory you don't you don't go out and name your team something derogatory you know you just oh i'm gonna get behind that that sounds brilliant Uh, we it's madness we live in complete madness right now and it's making me angry i'm getting all angry here on a podcast (laughs) now this is the place to get angry but you know my brother had a a good funny thing to say he always does these people and how they're going after this stuff he goes "You, you don't even care you really don't even care yeah, look, you went after my family. You uh, you eliminated my Aunt Jemima and my Uncle Ben. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it wasn't that funny, but it was to me. <laughs> well, uh, he makes everything funny. Yeah, he probably he added some sound effects in there. Yeah, there's there was another there. family member in there, too, that they went after. But that's the thing is uh, that, you know, um, oh, I got like the Land of Lakes uh butter you know there's yeah, that's got uh, an indian a, on it right yeah well they not anymore is that right yeah, oh of course not. she's gone that's and i mean ridiculous. you know <laughs> hey speaking of going after family members you see that book uh uh trump's uh oh husband, yeah is it was a niece niece it's, her, it's gone niece. after trump yeah yeah mary l trump too too much and never enough how my family created the world's most dangerous man I watched an interview with her, actually about half of it, because it was an hour long, and I, I don't find her to be that likable, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. So I, I don't know. What is it? How do you, like, the whole time I'm thinking, how do you, what's your motivation for writing a, uh, a scathing book about your uncle? Of course. Money. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's all about money. And, and it, it, you know, you've got a problem right off the, the, the tip of the bat with her, and that is that she... She signed an agreement to not put anything like that out there. So, I mean, you, if you put your name on something and you say, okay, this is like a non-disclosure agreement. I'm not going to write a book about the family. And then you go ahead and you do that anyhow for money. Yeah. How can you believe anything that this person says when they gave their word about something and now we're supposed to trust their word about this? Mm. I, that, that's That's one problem. But... Here's another thing is she's going around saying that uh, Trump hired somebody to take his SAT test. And oh, right. I saw the that. The problem is, is that, you know, this happened before she was born. Mm. Um, it, the, the widow of this person she's saying wrote, did the SAT is saying, well, Trump and my husband didn't actually know each other until they were in college Mm. Um, but she says she has sources that are reliable and she trusts those sources but then i go back to 
wait a second, how are we supposed to trust you when you mm. broke a sacred trust in order to write this book in the first place? I think there's a lot of problems with this, but the other thing too is um, she, she just doesn't come off as believable or likable. I, I mm. saw her for a couple of minutes on the news last week and it was just like, oh, well, here's another person looking to cash in on this. For sure. Industry. But I'll say this. I, I don't find Trump likable uh, myself. And I'm sure that there's just tons of awful things that you could say about him. I just don't really have an interest in that. Uh, that stuff. I don't at, at all. The only interest I have is the fact that she would write a book about her uncle like this i i, I just find that mystery right there to yeah be why go after your family like that i mean yeah think about Ooh, it it's dark like, if you're if you your own uncle why would you write a tell-all book about your uncle how I, uncomfortable I, is thanksgiving gonna be i you know and one of the things they I, it was george stepanopoulos interviewing her and, I, and he asked her you know if you could give him you know one word of of advice what would it be and she says resign it's like what wow. a jerk it they, was this hey. it was the interview with stepanopoulos, stepanopoulos yeah. that i was watching there was a part uh, I thought was very interesting where she uh, clearly wanted to make a point of this is a man who's never been loved, and which is a horrible thing to say. That and Stephanopoulos terrible... said, well, his kids love him. Yeah. And she got very stymied there. It's like, <laughs> she never thought of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then she seem... finally says, well, do they? Uh, that, that's all horrible. It's horrible. Like okay. I said, so I that's think proof. Yeah, I think there's endless things that you can find on Trump as stories uh, that you could dig up about horrible things he said and and even done. And uh, I I think that most people knew and expected all this when they voted him in the office. We knew he's, all, he's a cheater with his family uh, as a husband, and we we all know that. Right. Um, right. not why he got elected. He got elected because no. he's not a politician. Well, and, and it's funny because I've always said this, that it was really the couple of presidencies, the three presidencies that led up to the Trump election that caused Trump to get elected. Yeah. Well, That's kind of what it, I think. And Hillary rigging the DNC so yeah, that yeah. Hillary's your candidate, the worst candidate like ever. How you know? about that? Yeah. That, and then, that and definitely then four years later, they, they give us Biden. I, yeah, four years. Point and you come Biden. up with Biden. I'm telling you, how do you, how do you, how do you get behind that? I, I don't, I, drop I, don't the ball I think there. the only way that you get behind that is through your hatred of Donald Trump. That's it. I mean, that's to me, I don't find anything, any redeeming yeah. qualities there, except for if you hate Trump, you're going to vote for Biden because yeah. what other choice do you have? No, I totally agree. What a mess. What else we got going on? Let's do just, uh, we always got to talk about a little bit, but COVID has gotten bad, man. It, well, our cases are up. Deaths are up. Uh, ER visits have tripled uh, here in Cleveland. Um, it, it's bad. I don't know what to say. All I know is there's four different uh, vaccines that are going to clinical trials now that sooner, sooner the better. I can't wait to get on the other side of this, but it's got to be worse for you because you guys are under such lockdown, such an oppressive lockdown. Well, it, it is, you know, I got to say this, that I don't, I hate the lockdown. I think it's terrible. Uh, but, um, you know, it could, it could be worse. Uh, it was worse before with the, uh, the COVID uh, lockdowns, because I mean, pretty much everything was closed, but at least now, at least the restaurants aren't all closed um yeah. they the outdoor venues are still open and that's how about the the outdoor dining at denny's that oh, story well, you shared with us was hilarious you know it's interesting i wanted to just go off of that just the uh, part two on that is i yeah. read an article about uh <laughs> restaurants in new york city where patrons have actually been attacked by rats oh i saw that that's horrible and I, I don't know about um, New York, but I remember, uh, man, some of the rats here in Los Angeles are as big as Chihuahuas. Um, it, that would be hard. I mean, think about, think about what kind of disease you could get if Ugh. you were bitten by a rat. Ooh, I don't know. To me, I would take my chances with COVID rather yeah. than be bitten by a rat. Yep, same here. 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, speaking of COVID, it's interesting. I, I wish I could share my screen. Uh, you have it disabled, actually. But um, there are some interesting statistics. Let's face it. There is a lot of news about this. It's shut down a lot of our city. Our churches, I, I was I was talking about this last week where mm -hmm. you can't sing in church now and that's a major tenant of praise and worship and is this constitutional? Well, after that, they shut the churches down. So oh. no more church out here. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, you know, if you take a look at some of the stats that are out there, I've got some nationwide COVID-19 metrics that are up right now. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing that we've seen here is the, uh, the correlation between, between daily tests, daily cases, currently hospitalized, and daily deaths. And one of the things that you're seeing is that the testing has gone through the roof. I mean, back at the beginning of May, we were, we were almost up to about 300,000 a day. Today, we're way over 800,000 tests per day. And it seems to have a direct correlation, uh, if you take a look at uh, May and June, to the daily cases increasing as well. Now, we know one thing, two things actually we know about that, is that uh, the daily cases, there's two types of tests. There's the antibody test, there's a diagnostic test. The antibody test doesn't necessarily mean that you have COVID right now, and you could be asymptomatic. So these things can be a little bit deceiving. The hospitalization rate, yep, we've seen that go up, especially since June. It seems to have uh, hockey sticked here in July, as you're saying. Um, and but we also see the death rate, um, even though it's gone, it's ticked up a bit. And I think you have, uh, you were saying that it, you know, we had the most since May. But if you take a look at those May numbers. Those May numbers are tremendously high compared to the death rates today. Um, here's a couple of other things to think about too, Barry, is that I was seeing a lot of news over the week about how they were taking away the reporting numbers from the CDC and they were putting it into the Health and Human Services. And a lot of people were saying, well, this is how Trump is gonna hide the numbers. Well. Health and Human Services is actually, the CDC actually rolls up to Health and Human Services. So in other words, it's a division of Health and Human Services. I'm not really sure how Trump is going to hide those numbers that way. They're trying to look at a way to, uh, to normalize the numbers right here. And the CDC mm -hmm. has even admitted that uh, the numbers are a bit deceiving because of the way that they've been reporting them. So um, I, I think everybody needs to stay calm and try to look at this from a fact-based uh, situation as opposed to uh, this politically charged emotional situation. It is terrible that we have to politicize this too. It, it is. And it just, it, it, the fact that this is happening during the election year, the fact that we have so much parody, the fact that this, there's, there's uh, the whole Black Lives Matter thing is happening and this at attack on Trump, this whole thing, this becomes politicized and it's hard hard to actually know what exactly is going on. One other thing that I'm noticing too is with hospitals, uh, when we talk about the reporting, you know, hospitals actually get more government money with the more COVID cases that they get. So they're not exactly incented to tick down on the numbers. So, you know, I, I, there's, I don't have all the facts here, but I can tell you that there's just something my my there's 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 something in my gut that says to be suspicious about what's happening right here especially as i take a look at wait a second these school systems are going to be closed again starting fall season what that's a tough one you know what I, that, how does that even make sense i don't even understand I, I when when kids are the least vulnerable to covid just closing down the schools, uh, even a couple months before the school system starts. I don't know. There's well, it's something that, that's got my suspicion. Dishes. They're not, you yeah. know, they're not at risk for death. They're just a, uh, they could quickly uh, spread the disease. Yeah. See, but as I'm taking a look at the numbers and everything, and just that's not. I'm looking at some graphs right now. It's not adding up to me. 
It's mm. just not adding up. I, I agree that you like you're saying hospitalizations are up. Yep. I see that. Uh, but I think there's, there's still more to be looked at here. And again, the suspicion meter is going up on me mostly because we're in an election year and they're trying to get yeah. Trump out of there. And the people that are in charge of the media for 99.9% and are, and also in the bureaucracies, including the CDC, all of them actually, they want Trump out of there. And so it's it, this, I don't know. I, I can't tell you for sure, but I'm suspicious. Mm. Well, it's obviously extremely real. I certainly, for one, is, was very wrong uh, thinking that by June, uh, it, it's become summer, that it would be largely forgotten about because it's a flu. I thought it was just going to you know, dissipate. In fact, we heard a lot of theories that that would happen. And then, but watch out for that second wave in the fall. Well, it, it, it is, it's staying here strong. All through summer, so it's uh, it's serious stuff. Yeah, but I, I, I I'm not and the trying worst to discount thing. the seriousness of it. But I but what I would say is that it seems to me that a lot of the people that are testing positive right now are testing positive with very mild symptoms of mm -hmm. cold like symptoms. And so mm -hmm. again, we just go back to this. Yep, it's a real thing. Um, but how serious is it? And I take a look at the death counts on this, and I say. Wait, going from May to now, it does appear to me that the worst is way behind us. Mm. It, I just, I'm looking at it right now. It, it seems to me that, uh, that that's the case. Yet that's not, that's not how the media is portraying it. Mm. Well, and <laughs> it seems to me that it's beneficial to tamp down on, on the economy until Joe Biden gets elected. Well, I, I mean, I hate to say it that way, but it just looks like that. I, I am more concerned about the economy than I am the, the virus itself. And uh, I mean, hey, it's real. I absolutely believe that we have to take the measures that we have been taking in order for it to not completely skyrocket even more out of control. But uh, man, I was listening to this podcast a few days ago. Peter Schiff came on Rogan's podcast, and he's the guy, he's largely famous for predicting the real estate bubble burst and what happened to the economy there. Uh, he was right about that. And he went on and on. In fact, I only got halfway through it because, frankly, it was he is the most annoying podcast guest I've ever heard in my life. He just. Why, why is that? He would not shut up. You know, <laughs> Rogan is the, he's literally, the, Rogan's the most polite podcast host ever. And he's a great interviewer because he doesn't talk over people. He's very nice and accommodating to everybody. But this Peter Schiff, he would never shut up. And uh, Rogan's just trying to interject a, an intelligent question. It, what Rogan, I think, does best is he asks the questions that you would want asked. You know, he right. does it for you. And, and there's one point where he's, he just keeps going, Peter, Peter, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> he couldn't get in. The dude has got to exercise a mute button. Anyway, so I couldn't get uh, more than halfway through it. But Schiff was saying that uh, what we all kind of suspect and fear, that you just print up all this trillions of dollars and throw it into the economy the dollar is going to lose all value. Inflation is going to skyrocket out of control. And uh, he, he thinks uh, we got an absolute economic disaster heading our way quickly. There's that. Well, I hope he's wrong. I uh, hope he's wrong too. I don't, I've never understood how you, you print up trillions. <clears throat> Yeah, I think if you keep the economy closed, you pay people more money to stay home than to go to work. Um, you uh, keep kids out of school so that they don't get an education, uh, so that they're, they, they can't get a skilled job, that, um, that these things are a way to destroy the economy. And this is back to what I was saying before, is that it does feel like you made a comment that you feel like these precautions are necessary. I don't agree with that. I 100% disagree with that because the precautions are what will cause the economy to crash. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are people that are in the know that absolutely realize that and that that is what the purpose of what we're doing is. 
And, and, and when they can do that, they can consolidate power into a particular party that has a plan and an agenda mm. to control you 100% and take away your liberties because that gives them all the power that they need to never relinquish that power again. Mm. All right. All right. We are back at a little technical difficulty there. Yeah, just when I was making a great point, the what was it? Total... gods came down and uh -huh. stole my thunder. No, no, no kidding. But you no, know, it was because I was criticizing um, Joe Biden and oh. the uh, uh, the fact that he's trying to steal our liberties, but somehow Ooh. that must have cued some kind of alarm down in his right. Delaware bunker, and he cut me off. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> well, uh, let's pick up right back there. Um, well, I don't know. What else do you, do you have more to add to that? I just feel like it, what I was actually saying was that the you were saying that uh, you felt that these measures that they were taking in order to protect us from COVID-19 were were needed. And what I was saying was, well, those are the exact measures that are going to destroy the economy and yeah. are, are actually destroying the economy as we speak. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be devastating to all of us. And that the people that are orchestrating this for example, the governor of California are doing this on purpose, knowing it full well, and that's what their agenda actually is. I see. You know what I would love to get out of this is, man, roll with the, roll with the uh, idea of change, which is what, they, well, they want to change us into a communist uh, country government for sure. Right. But if we roll with that and if we hit economic devastation and people are once again in the rioting kind of mood, ah, boy, if we, if we overhauled this government and cut it down to about one, one hundredth of what it is currently privatize, uh, really, truly privatize, I should say, bring capitalism into the healthcare system, completely overhaul the healthcare industry, uh, uh, privatize, education, prioritize everything. The government should not be running anything. I agree. And uh, everything gets infinitely more bureaucratic and less efficient. Like really, it's, it's kind of like uh, the welfare thing. Uh, I forget where I read the statistic in it. And it, I don't know, maybe it's hyperbole, but uh, they said it before before welfare, government welfare, uh, we use the Blue Cross and United Way and it, truly giving uh, privately. Uh, like 90% of your dollar went to what you intended it to go to. Right. 10% went to ex expenses because these, these, we insist that these operations run lean or we're not giving them money. And That's exactly right. Now the government takes it over. 90% of your taxpaying dollars that's supposed to go to that goes through bureaucratic inefficiency. 10%. At, at, at least 90%. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and that's that you're not, you're not exaggerating the numbers there. The, we those can, are, those are proven out. I'm saying we could get out of any economic hole out of any economic failure downturn. If we did this to our government completely that's exactly overhauled right, and Barry. made it back to what our founding fathers actually intended. Ah, uh, Amen, brother. Preach it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'm serious. I think that we should say that even if briefly in every episode, like as this change, we have change taking place, uh, a fight for change taking place right now. Let's ride that wave and make it the kind of positive change that it should be. Yes. That's the, that's the attitude change that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. That's exactly right, Barry. I lost my tea. Oh, well. Don't you hate that? I do hate that because my mouth gets dry as I'm flapping my gums so much. <laughs> uh, hey, let's, uh, let's go to some lighter stuff. Uh, you know, though. I, I, I got some good stuff, too. Cool. I wanted to ask you, though, because we were talking about Trump and that uh, book that came out. I see a note that you, I, I don't know what this is. How, tr <laughs> how Trump is making black America great again? Yes. Tell yes. me about it. I don't know if that's lighter, if that's the lighter side or not. But okay. I'm actually... I'm actually reading a book now. I'm actually going back to, uh, to my notes on this, but I'm reading this really great book. Let me see if I can find my notes because it's kind of, in, I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, here we go. Ah, that's not it. But the, the policies, let me just go off the top of my head. The policies that Trump has 
started, lowering corporate taxes, uh, the immigration policies, um, the uh, e even his his policies around abortion. Let's, let's start with uh, lowering corporate taxes. Lowering corporate taxes actually allows for business owners to invest more into their businesses, which cause more jobs to be available, especially low paying jobs, uh, low skill labor jobs, jobs that actually go into the ghetto. The immigration policies that are out there, it's, it, it's a very low reporting, but we actually have stopped a major influx of people coming through that border. Everybody's calling them all these names for that. But these people are coming in and working for pennies on the dollars for jobs that typically black people would be working for in the inner cities. In other words, they're losing their jobs to illegal immigrants. This, these two factors alone equate to the fact that during the first uh, three years of the Trump administration, you saw the lowest black unemployment statistics in American history. Mm -hmm. And so you take a look at some of the other things that are happening. I talked about abortion. We can say whatever you want about abortion, but in cities like uh, New York City, one out of only one out of five pregnancies actually come to a birth. The other four are aborted. Think about the um, amazing amount of population that's actually wiped out by that. This is actually having a tremendous impact on the family and the value of the family, mm -hmm. not to mention many other downstream effects that are happening on that. Sometimes I think about guys like... Um, uh, the guy that's in charge of HUD right now, uh, Ben Carson. And mm. how many Ben Carsons have we wiped out through that whole Planned Parenthood um, uh, appeal that's happening in the inner cities right now? This actually is having an impact where uh, men and women uh, in the inner cities don't get married. They don't have to. Yeah. Uh, when uh, before this was all a big deal, the the black family was a very cohesive and solid unit, which actually equaled prosperity for the black family. This is what that whole book really is entailing. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's pretty interesting. Heavy stuff. Okay, you said that you. I know it's not the lighter side. <laughs> I know. I, I wanted to get there because we're gonna start winding up the podcast anyway. But you said you had some really good stuff. I, oh yeah. I, 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 I wanted, only had one gossip piece, but go ahead. Okay, cool. Well, I just had, had two <laughs> things. One is uh, uh, a series that Anne-Marie and I have been watching on HBO called Perry Mason. Oh. And uh, it is, man, I, I love when you can find like a, a series that you can enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, this one is really sort of a take, a take off on the old Perry Mason that used to come on television with Raymond Burr. But this one is, instead of him being the, uh, the defense attorney, he's actually a, a private detective working mm -hmm. with a defense attorney. And I think they're on the fourth episode of it right now. And it's sort of this, uh, this, this uh, law case that's happened and it's a big mystery and everything and they're investigating it. And it's, it's just fascinating. It's got us like, we can't, it's, uh, the new episode comes on tonight. I can't wait to see it. So no that's, kidding. That's, that's fun. number one. Yeah. Um, number two is that in the midst of COVID-19, while we can't go to uh, the movies anymore, uh, even drive-in movies are limited. We had one of our neighbors here. I live in a townhouse, and there's a there's a really cool area where we have a swimming pool. Last night we had a uh, we we had a movie out at the swimming pool. How we put fun! Up a big, uh, he put up a big uh, screen. And, the, and showed Raiders of the Lost Ark. How cool. Oh, it was really fun. It, we and it's a fun out, movie, you know? It is a fun movie. And it started like about 8.30 last night. And we nice. got all the lawn chairs and everything. We had the white screen up against one of the, one of the townhouses just nice. sitting around the pool. And there's just a handful of people out there. But 
man, Anne Marie and I had a great time just mm -hmm. checking it out and everything. We laughed and had a good time. Forgot together. about we, COVID for a little we bit. We actually watched the movie. We didn't talk to each other. We watched the movie. And it was so it was a trip down memory lane, you know, yeah. watch it. That's a great movie. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not too deep. So it's light enough that you could just enjoy. It yeah. really was. And so these are the kinds of things, you know, again, getting over the emotional part and, and, and getting creative. These are the kind of things we can do. And it brings the neighborhood together. Yeah. It was fun. No, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. All right. On the gossipy side, have you heard about uh, Johnny Depp and Amber, Amber Heard's trial? No. Trials? No, oh. but I tell you what, the things I, I heard leading up to it about w what's happening, like... Uh, didn't she beat the heck out of him or so, yeah uh, there's a lot of accusations it started with she uh is accused him of abuse and which he is now suing her for defamation of character and so he's got a couple other ex-wives uh and girlfriends and stuff like that who have all testified that he's never been violent right. so this would be a first but and, and i haven't i don't delve deep into this. I'm not that interested, but there's just so much out there every day now. And, um, and it, it just sounds like such, it was such a toxic relationship. So he came out. So I think if I got it right, it started off with Twitter blowing up originally about, Oh, uh, Depp is an abuser, you know, me too movement, all this kind of hysteria started. Well, then these tapes were leaked of the conversation, the fights he's having with Amber and she's just flipping out and saying all kinds of horrible things. And I, so I think I didn't listen to all this, but I listened to a little bit of it. I think it, it's the proof that he was not abusive and that she was the one that's actually the abusive one, but he's, and I, what I got out of the little bit, I listened to the tape. He's very passive aggressive. Like he's baiting her the whole time mm -hmm. and she's flipping out cause she's, she's a psycho chick. I know mm -hmm. this years ago, I had a girlfriend that did the same thing that she would, and she got a couple drinks in her. We would go out. She would flip out. Like uh, you could count on it. She would go, go psycho at night. And she was having an episode this one uh, night at my house. And she's saying that she's going to mark herself. She says this to me. I'm going to oh mark gosh. myself up and tell my cop brothers that you beat me up. Oh my gosh. It's diabolical. Dude, I called the police and I had her escort. I, they took her away. I, I had this immediate, immediate um, light went on uh, of, about what that meant. It's like you as a man, you can't win that. No, you're not going to win that. And you can't put that with that cat back in the bag. Nope. Okay. She said that. Then she just proved to me that she's capable of doing that. So it's a man. I, I'm sitting on a ticking time bomb. Tell me you the, broke up with her right after Oh, yeah. That. Okay. Absolutely. Thank God. There's no, there's no good. And then you know what happens is if she does do that, there, yeah. the man is still going to get the blame because yeah. it's going to be like, well, you know what people are going to say? Oh, you're telling me that uh, she said before that she threatened that she was going to mark herself up and now she does it? Well, it's his fault. He already knew that she was capable. Yeah. She threatened yeah. it. It's his fault. It's his fault. That's what, what happens. Terrible thing. Yeah. Ah. So uh, anyway, so Johnny Depp finds himself. I'm just saying, I totally relate to that. Yeah. Johnny Depp finds himself in the same situation as you can't win that. It's so anyways, I guess if he wins a lawsuit for defamation of character for $50 million, then I guess he can get on the other side. You know, what's horrible about the story that you just told is that a person that does that makes it harder for people that are actually being yes. abused to be yeah. believed. And yes. that's really, the, I think people should be severely punished for that too. thing. And, and that, it, I don't think they do. I don't think no, that. I don't think, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we do need some work on that, but you know, the ugly part about this is with their trial and all of their dirty laundry is being aired publicly. Uh, yeah, Didn't I, know. I tell you in the last podcast that one of the biggest shocking things is she, uh, defecated in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> like as a okay. no you didn't tell me him. that really what oh huge geez. headlines this okay. is like well, these are imagine? headlines these are headlines yes oh, how embarrassing oh you I would, would think. Not want to be so he started calling her amber turd 
because <laughs> her name's Amber Heard. <laughs> but, How horrible. Yeah, so all, I mean, and then all of his uh, drunken, druggy binges are, you know, all of this is coming out on record. Uh, uh, it's just so horrible. It's you know, the thing is, is you see these celebrities and everybody's, oh, I wish I had what they have. I wish, I, oh, it's so yeah. glamorous and everything. Yeah. And be careful what you ask for. Yeah. You know, I mean, be happy being you. Mm. <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, uh, we live here in Los Angeles and we see all these people living in these ma mansions and everything. But when you hear stories like this, and these aren't uncommon. Uh, right. These people are dealing with happiness is where it's at. Yeah. Money does not cause happiness. Fame does not cause happiness. Mental stability does. And meeting your needs. Yeah. Yes. You got to have your needs met. All right. So if you're starving, uh, need shelter, something like that, that's going to chip away at your happiness. But if you can have those, this brings it right back to where we started talking in this podcast. But if you do have your needs met, the second thing you need to do is find your best uh, mental state over time meaning if you're unhappy in your career your job whatever find something that you're going to be happier in where you're contributing to society in a positive way that's what's going to make you happier and then you got to have a, a good stable if i'm not saying you have to have a relationship but you have to have a stable healthy one yeah I, I i agree with what you're saying and i i just really believe that uh, as you're accumulating knowledge and wisdom and you're able to it's sort of like being on the airplane that that where they tell you the airplane's crash and you got to get the yep. oxygen for yourself first because if yep. you don't have that oxygen for yourself you're not going to be able to help your kid next to you that's right and so you get this for yourself and then you take your eyes off yourself and you put it on other people and yep. that seems to be a formula for happiness boy that's it that's it and how about we wind up with those beautiful yeah. gem right there I like that. Oh, great talking to you, Merle. Can't wait to you uh, too, see Barry. you next week. Okay, All right. Sounds you. great. See you, everyone.